welcome to Barnyard Language. We are Katie and Arlene, an Iowa sheep farmer and an Ontario dairy farmer with six kids, two husbands, and a whole lot of chaos between us. So kick off your boots, reheat your coffee, and join us for some Barnyard Language, honest talk about running farms and raising families. In case your kids haven't already learned all the swears from being in the barn, it might be a good idea to put on some headphones or turn down the volume. While many of our guests are professionals, they aren't your professionals. If you need personalized advice, consult your people. Welcome to another episode of Barnyard Language. We are taking a brief holiday before starting season two of the podcast. This episode was previously released, but we think you will enjoy listening again, or maybe you're hearing it for the first time. We will be back in September with our first anniversary episode. As always, we would appreciate if you would follow, rate, and review the podcast so more people can find us. Even better, share your favorite episode with a friend. If you are a fan of the podcast, please consider becoming a patron through Patreon. Listener support means that we can continue to make the show. Time is all a figment of our imagination. Oh God, don't start with me. (laughs) It's too early to start drinking Arlene, or maybe it's not because it's actually an hour later. Yes, it's almost noon somewhere. Welcome to Barnyard Language. We are Katie and Arlene, an Iowa sheep farmer and an Ontario dairy farmer with six kids, two husbands, and a whole lot of chaos between us. So kick off your boots, reheat your coffee, and join us for some Barnyard Language. Honest talk about running farms and raising families. In case your kids haven't already learned all the swears from being in the barn, it might be a good idea to put on some headphones or turn down the volume. While many of our guests are professionals, they aren't your professionals. If you need personalized advice, consult your people. (laughs) So welcome back to Barnyard Language. So today we're talking to Wendy Johnson and Johnny Rafkin from, are you guys rural Charles City? Is that where you prefer to be? Yes. Okay. Rural Charles City. They are taking over Wendy's parents' farm in Northeast Iowa. In addition to farming and selling direct to market, Wendy is also the president of the Practical Farmers of Iowa Board. Johnny, I realized as I was writing this that I don't know what you're doing for work, and I didn't want it to sound like it was like, Wendy does lots of shit, and we assume Johnny does something. We don't know what it is, but we assume. I'm sorry, that probably is what I'm going to put in at the beginning of the show, because I've started putting an outtake in, like, before the intro music, because it makes me laugh to do it. Like, that's a a good assumption. Wendy does a lot of shit, and Johnny just kind of exists. No, I just realize that I know more about what Wendy is up to than what you're up to so I just got there and that's kind of the way I like it I kind of like to be in the background and let Wendy take center stage because she's more important than I am you gotta know he is full of sarcasm so everything that he says in this is not line sarcasm not everything so we are not really taking over you're not really taking over. <laughs> i mean we're part line. of it <laughs> but i don't want i don't want to say like we're we're taking over rawr. like it's not like that it's more because we work with in-laws well his in-laws my parents you know they're still a big part of the business so i don't want to say we're taking over we're working with my parents and on our parents my parents farm and another thing, I am no longer the president of PFI. I, I am on the board, but Seriously. I... <laughs> it's just going to be the preface to this episode. Absolutely nothing said in here is accurate. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I stepped down because another board member and I came on the board at the same time, and we leave the board at the same time, and she wanted to also be president, so we split our time in half. So that's... I've got another year. I found too, having anyway. been on a number of boards that a lot of times you're ready to step down from things like that. Soon. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a lot. There's, well, you need more after nine years. I think it, you just need more different ideas and, and things on the, on the board. So I kind of feel like I'm taking someone else's place, like spot that should be there. Yeah. Not that I'm not full of ideas, but you know, there's always like the Katie Palmer's and and martha mcfarland's you know that should be on there hint hint i actually just got asked to be on the board of our kids preschool this week so i'm trying to stay gonna do it things. yeah oh <laughs> one one board at a time right yep exactly 
So the question that we're asking each of our guests on this podcast is what are you growing? So that can include business, farm, family, platform, anything like that. So what are you guys growing? What are we not growing? Do you want to talk about Joya and I'll talk about Senator? And, sure. And then we'll come together with kids. And... Sure. Do you want me to? Okay. Go for it. Well, on, on Wendy and, and our farm together, Joya Food Farm, we raised almost everything, lambs, pigs. We raised just over 200 broilers this year and eggs and every year we always buy turkeys for to raise up for Thanksgiving. So we have 13 of those right now that are wandering the farm. And we have a few cows, a few Dexter cows also. And we also have ducks that just seem to keep finding hiding places and laying eggs and having ducklings. And I think this year we unintentionally hatched about 50 ducklings. So if you guys know anyone who needs any ducks, let us know. Johnny, what breed are they? They're Muscovies. Yeah, that's the problem. We've got the same issue over here. And yeah. they, you know, they go back out into the creek in the sheep pasture and have ducklings. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one day, like 50 ducks came up out of the pasture. And I was <laughs> like, there were three of you. So I'm not quite sure. But they, they do say that the Muscovies are the best at eating fly, lar fly larvae. So yeah. if you have flies and cow patties and all that stuff, they're really good. And don't forget our trees and oh, fruits. Yeah, we've been over the last three years, we've been planting quite a few trees. I think just over 4,000 trees and bushes that we've planted over the last three years. We also have a micro apple orchard where this year we produced our first apples, which was pretty exciting. I didn't get to eat any because they went bad before I got to them, but Wendy was able to score two apples and she said they're really delicious. And I think our pigs got the ones that weren't so good. And, and chestnuts and hazelnuts chestnuts and hazelnuts so we're growing quite a few things raspberries blackberry black raspberries gooseberries elderberries elderberries and comfrey <laughs> comfrey spreading like crazy and then we're also doing pollinator habitats planting pollinator habitats which we get a lot of really pretty wild uh, flowers and grasses and we also well that gets into center view's part, but and then we we grow a child. We have we have one child, and we grow her, help grow her, and she's eight. And yeah, we're growing the farm. The oh, the other we grow farm business. Katie mentioned about business too. We use our sheep wool because we were getting such terrible price for wool that we just would sell to the shear and the shear like aggregates it from all of the sharing jobs and then he just ships it to China and then little children pick apart wool and put it into gap sweaters or whatever it is so we wanted to halt that process and not and keep our wool and so we started a wool sleeping product company called Counting Sheep Sleep Company and we sell wool filled uh, pillows and comforters and sleep masks and anything you need for a woolly good night's sleep. So that's a business that grew out of COVID, actually. And so that's something where we're growing. Centerby Farms is the is our family farm and that mostly works on that farm. And we raise corn and soybeans, hay, as well as some small grains like cereal rye and oats. And we just start, started a new grain called Kernza. It's a perennial intermediate wheatgrass. And so we planted that as well. We'll see how that comes up next spring. And we plant prairies too within all that. So it's, it's, farms are always evolving and growing, right? And so ours is, ours is like that. Wendy, how many acres are you guys running? And are those two operations on the same farm or is that two different farmsteads then? Just yeah, so we have a good mental picture of. Yeah, so it, it's about our farm center. The whole family farm is around 1,200 acres okay. in north, north central, northeast Iowa. And Joya Food Farm, Johnny and I, we rent acres from our family and started Joya Food Farm. And that's about on, currently it's about on a hundred and, 
about 100, almost 100 acres, and we're transitioning another 45. So it'll be in the 150 acre range for Joy Food Farm. Okay, because Joy is certified organic then, correct? Yes. Okay. So if we can start back at the beginning, Wendy, I know I heard at a uh, field day one time about how your parents met. And if it's not, you know, too creepily personal, I thought that was a really interesting story. So if you could share some yeah. of that with us. And I think it's a great start to the conversation because <laughs> you kind of get the, you'll get the idea of kind of why I'm a kind of a, a black sheep because my mom and my dad are. My dad was he's 80 now and so is my mom and they met in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War conflict. My dad was working for a, the International Voluntary Service which is a, what was a precursor to the Peace Corps and kind of run by the State Department and then my mom was a airline stewardess for it was a Japanese airline but it was an airline because she could speak some English that brought officers and soldiers, flew them from Tokyo to Bangkok. And so my mom was on vacation visiting a friend in Vietnam, Laos. And my dad was based in the highlands of Northern Laos, helping kind of the, I guess in today's terms, colonize Laos. So he was teaching the Hills people in Northern Laos, Western agricultural methods for better efficiency and um, better growth of rice production and things like that. So he did that work there and he was on leave at the same time. And he was in across the, well, he was in Bianchan and he was headed to Bangkok. And so they were both on leave and there, there's the Mekong River splits Laos and Thailand and so they were my mom was trying to buy a, a ticket a ferry ticket across the Mekong but they weren't understanding her Lao and so my dad saw this I'm sure to him living up in the hills you know alone saw this beautiful you know young woman exotic looking woman um, standing in line um, having trouble buying a ticket and so he introduced himself and, and he could speak fluent Lao. So he went up and was the prince in, or what is it? Shining armor, the, the guy who saved the day and helped her buy the ticket. And they got on the train, or the ferry. I think it was a ferry. No, I'm sorry, it was a train. And they got onto the train, but she totally blew him off and was like, whatever. So then she went and sat in the, in part of the train that was pretty like upper class mm -hmm. and my dad back with like the the Lao people <laughs> I don't know exactly what it was but they're like class classes on the train you know mm -hmm. um, in terms of how much money you make and things like that depending on how much you wanted your you paid for your ticket and my dad was recovering from amoebic dysentery so in the back of the train all the Lao people especially men would like drink this really strong alcohol and he didn't want to partake. This is how he tells the story. He didn't want to partake in the drinking of the alcohol. So he thought, oh, I remember this really beautiful young woman that I was talking to and I helped buy the chicken. I'm gonna go try to find her and strike up a conversation. So he walked through the classes of the trains and, and train cars and went up and he, he asked my mom if she wanted to go to the beverage car and share a Coke. So ever since then, I guess, they had this romantic few weeks in Bangkok, Thailand. Then my dad went his way and my mom went her way. And three months later, my mom had her bags standing on the porch of my dad's tiki hut in Northern Laos. And that was it. It's a good one. It's a good one. You know, yeah. my, my, I don't think my, they didn't tell my grandparents that they got married or my dad didn't. So they just, after the fact, they said, hey, I'm bringing, you know, I, I got married. <laughs> I'm bringing home a <laughs> Japanese bride. And we live in my grandparents, Johnny and I do. And so I, I can't imagine, you know, what my dad or my grandparents kind of thought. But it's interesting because my aunt, my dad's oldest sister, she was involved with the, she lived in Chicago and was part of the Black Panther movement. And she dated a Black Panther and she brought 
him here to this farm because she was involved in the kind of the Chicago riots and things like that during the Democratic Convention. And she wrote a book about it. But I remember her saying that my grandparents made him sleep in the basement. And the, our basement here is like this old limestone, like raw, <laughs> wet, damp <laughs> basement. And he had to sleep down there. And then, you know, my, my aunt had to sleep upstairs on the second floor. And my, my grandparents slept in between to make sure, you know, I'm sure my grandpa had like one eye open and one when I closed. But my other aunt, she married an Iranian during the Iran Contra affair. And so I Iranians weren't, you know, considered, they weren't very popular in the United States at the time. So anyway, she married an Iranian and he was a really nice guy. I just really liked him. And so we kind of come from a family of <laughs> well, out outlaws. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so her dad married a Japanese woman right after, you know, World War II, shortly after. Her aunt was dating a Black Panther after civil rights. And then her other aunt got with an Iranian right after the Iran <laughs> So yeah, I guess they like to buck the system. <laughs> Go against the grain. Yeah. So Johnny's so that, really like the least shocking man you could have come home with, is what you're pretty saying. Pretty much. Pretty right. much. Yeah. He's just a, a surfer kid from Southern California that knew nothing about agriculture culture. Wendy, that leads us right into my next question, because, you know, in the process of getting ready for this show, I mean, obviously, I know you guys, you know, through different farm programming and app, but, you know, give it a good Google and check it out. And the first article that comes up is this huge modern farmer, I think it was spread. This Wendy has a lot of publicity when you Google her about how you were an LA fashion blogger before you moved back to start the farm with your surfer honey is that accurate because i feel like there's like a hallmark movie about this or there could be like i feel like you guys are really missing an opportunity here i think hallmark movies would be too tame for, for us <laughs> yes that is true though don't envision that i was like some high-powered fashion blogger that worked with the kardashians or anything like that 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 was not at all i wanted to work in television and film as a wardrobe stylist. And so that's why I moved to Los Angeles in 2000. And then I realized that I was not made for Hollywood people life. And, but I have this really strong interest in fashion. So I ended up working for a, a denim company, but I also did fashion blogging on the side. And so, and then I worked my way into some content writing and ad marketing for, for companies as well as not much as much for fashion as for other things. I always had this interest in fashion and I don't know if it's still up, but it's called leanroger.com. And that was my, my fashion and lifestyle, lifestyle blog, which when I moved here, I had no time for anymore. And I'm so out of the fashion and cool lifestyle <laughs> uh, ways. So I kind of disconnected from that world, but one day maybe I'll get back into it. See, I figured that maybe this would at least give us some credibility with Arlene's teenage daughter who thinks that oh. we're desperately uncool, which is true. I, I mean, we are, we're pretty uncool. True so how did you, how did you and Johnny meet and how did you did you have to drag him back to Charles City or did he come willingly? So do you I hope nobody else from Charles City version? hears this because they're going to think we're being mean. So. <laughs> do you want my version or Johnny's version? I kind of want to hear both. <laughs> I don't know. I, I want to see how different they are because that seems a little. <laughs> Go ahead, babe. Is the bus running? Because I feel like I'm going to get thrown under it. Well, it was spring of 2008 and spring out in Southern California, Long Beach, where I, where I lived, is a lot diff different than here. Mm -hmm. It's probably in the mid 80s and, you know, it's pool weather and shorts and flip flops. And anyways, my cousin that was my roommate at the time, he was partially my roommate and he partially lived with his girlfriend at an apartment complex, which had a community pool where everybody shared. And anyways, I went over there. I was the first one there we're just hanging out we're like oh let's go to the pool and go swim and 
see if there are any girls over there. Because I was single. I had been single for a few years. So we went to the pool and we had some beers and we go swim for a little bit and we saw one girl laying at the pool and we tried to sit next to her and talk to her and pretty much she just turned around and didn't look back at us. So <laughs> we kept swimming a little bit and then we went back and saw this other really pretty girl laying down and she was facing one direction where wherever we sat, she had to look directly at us. And that happened to be Wendy. And so when we sat down, we cracked open a few beers and she heard those beers open and her head lifted up and she's not really a drinker, but she saw this really attractive guy, which was me. And, <laughs> and she asked if she could have one of the beers. And I said, well, I think she just needed something to drink anyways, but we happened to have an extra beer. And I said, of course you could have a beer. It was like the Coke for her parents. You know, we shared a beer, they shared a Coke and we got to chat and we were having a barbecue later with a bunch of people coming over. So we were talking and I invited her to the barbecue and she said, yeah, I'd love to come. Let me go back a second. She was only at this apartment complex because she was pet sitting for a friend of hers. So it just happened to be completely by chance that she was there. She didn't live at this complex, but, or she said, do you want to come with me and take the dog for a walk? And I said, sure. And she told me the apartment number and I very luckily remembered it. And I went up to the right, <laughs> the right apartment and she answered the door. So I was lucky that it was her and not some random person. I had to go search around a bunch of apartments for her. And we went for a walk with the dog and later we came back and went to the barbecue and hung out and I introduced her to some of my friends and that was it. So my version's a little bit different. I said to myself that morning that I'm going to, I'm going to meet some people, you know, cause I worked from home. I worked remote. I didn't work in any office or anything. So I was in front of my computer all the time, all day. And I'm not really talking to anybody. And so I'm not really getting out to meet anybody either. So I had told myself this and I said, I'm going to go meet somebody, meet some people. And if they're having a barbecue, I'm going to invite myself to that barbecue. So with that, it wasn't really a saying I said to myself, but I told myself that in the mirror and my inner, inner voice was saying that. So I just let, let it out into the universe. And so I walked over to my friend's apartment and it happened. I, I spent the night, the next day in the morning, I woke up, it was really hot. I was like, gosh, it's so hot here. It's April, like middle, early April. I had just gotten back from Brazil, like I said, like I, and it's the opposite seasons in Brazil. So in the winter time, it's summer down there. And so I, I had my Brazilian bikini all ready to go. And, you know, I was tan already. So I, I went to the pool and I just was like, oh, you know, I'm going to hang out at the pool and I don't know, just hang out because I had some time. So anyway, I was laying there and I remember seeing these two guys. Well, one guy came over with his kid and he was talking with me and I, that didn't really feel right or anything. And then more and more people started to come to the pool. And there are these two guys that were at the opposite end of the pool. <laughs> I could see them like making their way down the pool because I was at the opposite end. And there were lots of girls along the way. And they were kind of just like, hey, what's up? And, you know, talking to several girls who are not giving them the time of day. And so I'm watching this kind of like in slow motion as they move, make their way toward the opposite end of the pool. More like Jaws. Where I am. <laughs> Jaws. And I, I just knew that they were going to, you know, they were going to, they were, they were going to say something or whatever. So I was hanging, I met this girl and I was talking with her that lived in the apartment complex and we were just hanging out, talking a little bit. And then these guys come up and she doesn't give them the time of day, but First of all, they were doing like flips and stuff <laughs> off the edge of the pool. Like they were showing off and it was hilarious. Oh, <laughs> and, I don't remember that. <laughs> and they were, and then they got up and they, I remember them shaking their, the, the, the water off their head, like, like, you know, shaking it off in slow motion. Like they're <laughs> like, I don't know, it was, it was just funny, which they didn't have a lot of hair anyway, but they went and sat like right in front of me that I had no, I couldn't look at anything else but them. And so they were like talking and I don't know, chatting and the 
and they obviously wanted my attention. So I finally said, hey, you know, they opened up some beers, which you shouldn't have beers at the pool anyway. So here they are already rebels. And so <laughs> I said, hey, can I have a beer? And then we started talking about his cousin's tattoo and, and, and whatever and stuff like that. So that's, and the rest of the story is pretty much how it is. But I see the whole pool scene as something totally different than what he remembers. Yeah, the slow motion hair glistening in the sun is a majestic uh, image. Cooler in your version, Andy. <laughs> I mean, his version was a little, this girl wouldn't talk to us. <laughs> so how did like things story. go from the California dream by the poolside to farming in Iowa? There seems to be like a, something must have gone on between that and uh, where you are today. So what led to the decision to, to move back to the farm? Wendy and I had been dating for about a year, and in 2009, her grandmother had passed away. So she had, knew, she had known at that point that her sister was never going to move back to Iowa and start farming with her dad. So these thoughts started going off in her head, like, what's going to happen with my parents as they age, and what's going to happen with the farm? Is it going to be rented out to the highest bidder? And, you know, Wendy and I, we started really paying attention to food as we were living together and we had a small little garden out there and so agriculture started I mean she grew up around it but growing food really started to play more of a, a role in our lives and she started toying with the idea that she was going to move back and then finally one day she said you know I'm going to move back to Iowa and I'm going to start farming with my dad and I'd really like it if you came with me and basically she was going to move in, in 2010. So she said, I'll give you some time to think about it, uh, whatever, whatever it takes you. And, you know, I'd really like, like you to come and, you it was know, a year. yeah, you I said, I'll give, year. I'll give you a year, but you and, decide, yeah. <laughs> so she gave me a year to think about it. And I said, okay, well, this is a big decision I have to make. All my friends and family are out in Southern California and it's all I've ever known. And it's what I lived. And I had a really, really fun and good job that I really loved with I worked at a bar out there that paid health benefits and had profit sharing and we made really good money out there and I just had kind of a nice easygoing really chill lifestyle I worked four days sometimes five I got to go to the beach when I wanted it was a nice nice uh, mellow relaxing life that I look back on so long ago. <laughs> but anyways, I, I was very undecided up until even after the fact I said I was moving, I was still undecided because I knew I could pretty much back out at any time. But her dad was trying to recruit me. He was sending me articles about things that Charles City was doing that seemed fun and cool to him. To so him. to him, you know, that he yeah. thought might intrigue me, but it wasn't, you know, there's I'm landlocked now I've never I've never right, had the, the the lack of ocean is a little bit of a effect it's a, it's a very big transition for somebody that's grown up around on the coast their whole life and to not be near it you feel almost claustrophobic when you get to it and you know you're alone so eventually we we decided that we were going to make the transition and I started having some going away parties and stuff out there and that's when it really started to, to hit home that I was leaving. And we had a semi truck come over and pick up all our big stuff and bring it here to Iowa. And Wendy and I loaded up her then Toyota Corolla with two cats and our dog. Three cats. Oh, we had three cats and a dog that was just packed. I mean, the only thing left was the front, the front two seats. And we started our cross country, almost cross country trip to to Utah to Colorado we had one stay in Omaha Nebraska and then we ended up here and that was our our journey 11 years ago and my goodness what what an eye-opening experience that was for me from going to bartending to being around hundreds of people a day to I'm a very social social guy I like to talk to people and be around a lot of people and then a month after I I moved here I was sitting in a tractor by myself for eight to 10 hours a day, 
hauling corn back and forth, the, this repetitive job that wasn't very exciting after a little while and depression started setting in pretty heavily. <laughs> and then the winter came and then more depression came with that. But that didn't stop me from asking her to marry me that, that Christmas. And yeah, you, you, he hadn't even proposed, so he still could have gotten out. <laughs> you know, he still could have left. So it's still kind of a mystery to me why, how he ended up proposing and then, you know, because that's a big step. That means you're going to move. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I, I want to add with that is, you know, we, we moved, this house was empty for, a, for over a year. And my, my grandmother, bless her soul, she was a, w a wonderful woman and I admire her in many, many ways, but she lived through the depression and so she, she held on to everything. And from basement to attic, it was full of stuff. And so when she had passed away, all of her children, you know, came and got the things that they wanted, but they, that didn't mean that they actually cleaned the house, like actually got rid of stuff. stuff yeah. Yes. Yes. All so, the good stuff is gone and you've got all the old mason jars and uh, yes. plastic containers. I, yeah. I was just wondering how many water cups you got. <laughs> in our basement that who knows how they might've been there since the great depression because <laughs> They look like science experiments gone wrong. I mean, holy <laughs> so, stuff. So, so some were full and some were empty. The stuff, I mean, it was, it was <laughs> the stuff I had to drag out of that basement. It, it was, I, I don't know. It was like I was in a, a TV show, freak show or something that <laughs> something might've been alive in there. Something might've been edible. I mean, but everything looked like it would kill you. <laughs> yeah. We, Johnny, we have a couple bottles of wine downstairs in our, we have a dirt floor limestone basement sounds like oh, the same as yours yeah. and yeah, yeah we have yeah. the same jars down there and there's at least a couple bottles of homemade wine that are probably most of at least 50 years old now oh my gosh. Wow. and you know occasionally we'll see one and joke about opening it to taste <laughs> it but nobody's quite braved it yet no one's braved so this 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 house and the chicken coop was full of newspapers and books and jars and my grandmother collected water bottles and so there were just jugs and jugs and jugs of water in the basement too and so when we moved here you know i i asked my dad like a hundred times did you guys clean out the house? Is it livable? Like, can we, can we actually sleep in it? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's great. It's cleaned out. Everything's gone. <laughs> we show up and uh, I walk in the back door and it's like nothing. What had changed since my grandmother lived here? Nothing. So we spent the first month, we, we moved here August 31st, was it? Yep. Of 2010. And we've spent most of September just cleaning it out and making it livable. Every day. Yeah. Going back and forth to the dump. This whole house was carpeted from, from the- Ceiling so, wall. I mean, <laughs> from, the, from the bathroom to the kitchen, everything had carpet on it, whether it was shag or flat carpet. I mean, some of it was better than others, but I've never seen carpet in a kitchen or a bathroom <laughs> in my life, which was very surprising to me and very, disgusting at the same time we peel it up and there's these beautiful hardwood floors underneath and it's like why well, cover up these hardwood floors with gross carpet but yeah that first month was just a lot of work and we had some help that was here with some of Wendy's Wendy taught English as a second language before we moved out here and we had a couple Korean a couple that was from Korea and then a Japanese guy and then we had two more of our students showed up flew out here and we had five foreign exchange students here with us in this house. So they were a like big a help. Month and a half. Yeah, yeah, for just over a month. Yeah, because they were here during harvest. Yeah. They were cooking lunch for us they and cook, stuff. They cooked Korean food for us at lunch. It was awesome. <laughs> I just don't know that, you know, you said your dad lived in the Laotian jungle for how long? I don't know that that's like the best qualification for how livable a house is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, I feel like your standards might be a little different, you know, after that. <laughs> crazy and our bathroom was carpeted when we moved into the farmhouse too oh yeah <laughs> I, uh, the best. 
So I feel like you kind of started to answer this question already, but so what were some of the other unexpected parts of the transition back to the farm or small town or working with family, that kind of thing? Oh, so this is one story that I really like to tell. So, you know, when you, when you're, when you live independently, you're, you know, you're a 30 something living independently in a big city, you know, you go to your yoga class, go out jogging or swimming, or you, know, you go to work, get your coffee, you know, you have like a routine, right? And so my routine that I had was I I'd go for a run in the morning or, and I'd offset that with yoga at home. And then, then I'd get ready for work and I'd, you know, go out Johnny would, at that time, we didn't have much for animals. So we were just like learning basically how to farm kind of. And so, well, not kind of really, we we're both learning how to farm. So my, when somehow, when someone learns that you are a new farmer or like you're the next generation that has come back to help their, your parents with the farm suddenly seed dealers start showing up at your door. And so I was doing my morning yoga at like seven in the morning. And I try to be done with that by eight, you know, so, but I was doing my normal yoga routine. And so I was in my, my, my yoga clothes and I get a knock at the back door and I, I open it up and these two farmer clad looking people walk in the back door. They just walk in, you know, they don't, you know, just walk in the door. Yeah, we're, we're, we learned that you're uh, back here farming with Erwin and, you know, we want to show you what we got available for seed. And I stood there and I'm in, and they were looking at me like, you're, did you just get out of bed? Or like, you know, you're in an <laughs> outfit that we don't recognize around here. And I, that was kind of like my first like wake up call that I'm not in California anymore. Like I'm, I'm, this is, this is a whole nother realm of, of a lifestyle that, that I am not used to yet. I got to figure that out. So, and they were there at like seven 30 in the morning and um, talking about seed sales. And, and I, I look back on that and I, I sort of feel s- stupid, but I also, I don't know, it's, it's the culture, it's the culture around here. And so when people talk about assimilation, I really had to reassimilate, I guess, because I don't remember that growing up because I wasn't involved in the in the farm business as a kid. And so I had to reacclimate too. I think I've reassimilated, but I don't know about Johnny if he has. He's still his his California self. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still, I mean, I grew up in where I grew up my whole life. So Iowa nice is definitely a thing out here. You know, everybody is really friendly and wants to show how cordial and everything they are. And Katie, I know you're you're definitely a sweetheart, but I know that you're very upfront and forward <laughs> from what I know about you. I'm going to assume that's a compliment, but okay. <laughs> it is a compliment. And I, I do, I love that about you. And I have a lot of that in me as well. And it took me a long time to not be so open with talking with people because I would let too many things out to people and people around here can be, you know, everybody's up in your own business, you know, all your neighbors need to know everything about everything. And so adjusting to that and not opening my mouth too much was a definitely a big adjustment. But also, you know, I was talking about the Iowa nice thing. Everybody is very friendly and nice. Um, to your face and but there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of talking that could go on behind your back which I'd rather people say it to you and not find out from somebody else but it is what it is so that's that's Iowa but Iowa also one of the greatest things I've I really love about people out here at least the people that I've met is that people will help you out at the drop of a hat you know if you need help moving or do, doing something on your farm people will definitely almost stop what they're doing and come in come and help you and that's something i really really appreciate about living in rural iowa living on a farm and the people that i've met out here that's it's a very very good quality i was just telling wendy about this the other day some of my best friends won't even help you when you need something to do and those are the people i love the most so that, that that's a big adjustment yeah, I mean, they might have a good gossip about you on the way home. 
but right. it'll help you first usually right you know <laughs> so when we first moved back here my sister happened to be getting married and she wanted to get married in in Charles city which we we're all surprised about because she married someone who is half Finnish, half Lebanese, and they live out in Huntington Beach, California. So, you know, we'd always thought, oh, they're gonna get married in Italy or something like that. But no, they, they actually got wanted to get married in Charles City. And so we were helping with their reception at the county fairgrounds, setting up the reception area. And little did I know, so there were like, I don't know, 300 some people invited to that reception and they're all like community members you know people from our our childhood or and neighbors and I mean just a lot of people we haven't seen in a really 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 long time and I look back on that event and I think oh my gosh you know all those people I mean they they're grounded and and live in this rural community and they they've lived here most of their lives they were looking at I mean, they were probably looking at all of us, like, who are these people or, you know, what, what are they going to do and become? And, you know, I'm sure I, I came, I came off as pretty aloof, you know, and kind of distant because I hadn't lived here for so long. It'd been almost 20 years since I actually lived in, in Charles city. And so I didn't really know how to react either. And I feel bad. I look back on it now and I feel bad that I didn't interact more with the, with the community members that were, that were all there, all the people that I'd seen, but I wanted to make it more of my sister's day and not about me. And so I, I just, I, I rewind through that sometimes because I'm, I'm the one still here and I, I feel like I should have really integrated and talked to those people a lot more instead of just kind of just went dancing you know <laughs> it, was a, it was a wedding how much can you can you do were there any parts of your transition back that were easier than you were expecting were there things that, that kind of came back right away or the or johnny that that just felt natural to you like i mean obviously there was a lot of the transition that would be challenging you know like like you said learning how to farm and all that kind of stuff but were there things that seemed like second nature or that, that came really easily well for me it took me quite a while to find what really came natural because when i mean i've always loved animals growing up and everything and when we first moved here all we had were 30 ewes at that point, all we had to do was go feed them, you know, three bales of hay a day and call it good. And yeah. the, rest, the rest of the time, it's like, okay, we're working on the house. And after harvest was done, back to work on the house. So there's not, there wasn't that much to do. So I got an off-farm job at one point, but it was, it wasn't really until almost five years later where I kind of had found my, my role. And when we started raising more animals around here. It was when we started raising pigs, I really found what I really liked. And when we started raising the lamb and raising them for meat, as opposed to selling them to somebody who was going to fatten them up and give them to a, a sale barn or whatever, I saw more meaning in what we were doing at that point, raising the animals for food. And it just had more of a, almost a spiritual connection for me to, to raise the animals the way that we kind of always wanted to do we were told it wasn't going to work and really uh, made a difference in, in my perspective on living here and living on the farm and and growing food and enjoying what you're doing because it wasn't all about production and efficiency right it was about actually respecting the animal and yeah and i mean then selling our, our meat and to our community and finding people who were like-minded like us and enjoying our food and I mean, it was, it was really delicious also. And so that just really made a difference in my perspective on what we were doing out here in Iowa and just made me feel a lot better about being here as well. My, I, my dad was constantly on Johnny when he, when we moved here. I mean, after he proposed and we got, you know, it, it was, my dad was always asking me, what's Johnny going to do? What's he going to do? what's he gonna do you know and I at that point I don't really think that any of us my parents or Johnny and I really knew what was going to happen like we really had no idea what 
what was happening? Who is going to work on, you know, help my dad with the corn and soybeans? Was it going to be him? Was it going to be me? Was it going to be both of us? Someone had to provide some off-farm income. Was it going to be me? Was it going to be him? You know, and so we were kind of, it was kind of chaos for the first few years. And at the same time, I was relearning about agronomy and agriculture. I had no idea even like what a corn plant needed, what, what were rotations, I didn't, I didn't know the basic agronomic skills. And so I, I went to school and, and learned those things and went to a bunch of meetings and things like that. Johnny refers it to that movie with Polly Shore, Son-in-Law. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. I was going to ask but... if this wasn't basically the Son-in-Law. I love <laughs> yes. that movie. Yes. It's so weird. <laughs> I've, I've wound up in a bunch of pig shit. So <laughs> just like crawl, Polly Shore. And so it just more developed into, I think because of Johnny's real, his character of being really lighthearted and, and sarcastic, that didn't really fit well with my dad, quite serious and, and um, pretty serious. So it kind of was that easily decided that it was me who could probably tolerate my dad more than Johnny. And we didn't want any rifts in our families because they only live two miles down the road and just to keep things at peace but really both of both of us Johnny and I had a lot to learn and we learned it through experience we also learned it by asking questions to my dad for example but basically I think it's come down to like I think I married someone like my mom <laughs> I think that's what it comes down to my mom is a real lighthearted funny lady Nurture. she's a nurturer and johnny is exactly the same way so and she's exotic i guess i married someone exotic I'm... and so that I've, I've basically come to that conclusion that that that's what happened that's what went down but yeah it was a lot to learn a, a, a lot to learn and so and figuring out our roles as as farmers and so gosh there's so many stories there's so many stories <laughs> that that first harvest was just uh I messed so many things up. <laughs> I drove across like prairie land or wet, uh, wetland. wetland land because, you know, there's a combine over on one point and what's the fastest way to get to it? It's a straight line and I don't know what an end row is. I just saw the combine over there and I just, I made a beeline for it and I plugged up the air filter of the of the tractor with all these cattails and <laughs> our foxtails and every that. That, that year, Wendy's dad was still running the combine, so her and I were hauling, hauling the grain, and her dad, the ladder, we'd always see it folding down, and we we're like, oh, shit, what, what did we do wrong? Because every time the ladder came down, he was going to come out, take a deep breath, and tell <laughs> us that we messed something up, and that was a long harvest, even though I don't think it rained once. I think it might have been three weeks, but holy hell, it took it, it was so long <laughs> it seemed like i never I driven a track for rain just to get a day off from you guys probably i mean her dad that first that first i don't know six eight months would just show up at our house walk in the back door there we had no zero privacy here because this was you know his parents house is where he grew up and he didn't have any any filter about walking in uh, into the house about I mean, no problem with it. And that was something we kind of had to put our foot down about that we're living here. You got to show us a little bit of respect. And there's a lot of things that we had to discuss that first year or so. Yeah, we oh. we swapped houses with Jim's folks, like literally packed both houses up and swapped in the course of one day. And we went through quite a a phase of his dad just walking in as well. And <laughs> he finally came wow. in one day and I was getting out of the shower. And he just came hiking in our house and he looked at me and he turned around and walked back out. And I think that was the last time he's done it. Just, like, you know, this is our house. I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, whatever. You're on your own here, buddy. Oh, I have a so, story. I kind of like that, Katie, but it's, it's nothing to do with an in-law. But we used to have neighbors that the girls would drive over and deliver us Christmas cookies every year. <laughs> One year, my dog was barking and Vivian was our daughter was just a little girl she was upstairs sleeping when he was gone and I come out of the bathroom and I hadn't gotten in the shower yet but I was just ready to 
And um, like, what's he barking at? He's gonna wake up Bibby and I go to the front door and there's a little slice of glass by the front door and there's the girls delivering cookies. And that's the last time we got cookies. As well. Yeah, we had, uh, we have a neighbor, you know, and the two families have lived next to each other for, I don't know, five generations, six generations, something. And he's an avid coon hunter. He's an older guy now, you know, and they, there's a big picture window in our dining room and I came out of the bathroom because there's only one bathroom in our house and you know had a towel thankfully but our entire yard was full of coon hunters and the lights were on in the house and it was dark outside and you know I know they all got quite an eyeful and I I told Jim about it and he goes well he's got five daughters I'm sure he's seen it he didn't need to see mine (laughs) so Johnny that leads real well into our next question about you know, we've talked to a lot of women who've married into farms, including Arlene and myself, but how has that transition been working with your in-laws and moving, um, moving in? Well, well, now, now it's, it's pretty great. You know, I mean, for me anyways, Wendy, Wendy does the majority of the heavy lifting with, with the family farm. She runs the combine, she runs the planter. She's involved with all the major, I mean, management decisions and buying and selling the seed and selling the corn. So she's definitely been groomed over the last 10 years to, to take over this spot, which she probably should be there now. I mean, her parents are in their eighties. I don't know when it's going to happen, but. Aren't you glad you're not in that spot? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Because my, I, I'd say something more than you ever could. Mm-hmm. So I help out on the farm, like the, the lambs are actually, the sheep are actually owned still by Centerview Farms, which is the family farm. And I'm pretty much the, the animal husbandry person here where I take care of the majority of the animals here. And so raising the sheep and the lambs is, is my job. I get heavily involved with lambing. I'm very, I take it very personal. I really... I really love it. And then during planting and harvest and baling hay, any any days I have free, I I do all that stuff and check all, all the bins in the winter. I gotta climb the bins, you know, once every once every week or every other week. Well, the major things are are basically I just carried our child in my in my womb and he basically took this baby and raised it like he was if he had tits the baby he would do that because he's such a nurturer and so, so Johnny's like he the daddy seahorse he is he's the daddy seahorse that's right I pretty much took over the role of farm wife after I mean we had our daughter and I don't know if I'm should say this out of taken out of turn but you didn't change very many diapers and I think you'll admit that right totally okay and once she was done breastfeeding the it was she she was she didn't have a, I didn't have a full-time job so I would get up and change Vivian in the middle of the night and feed her and daddy daycare I was daddy daycare it was it was fantastic and I loved it I got to spend so much time with with her until she was off to preschool and I got to hear her first words and watch her first steps and oh and I pretty much took on the role of being a being the farm wife you know I I, I cook all the meals here i do all the dishes, I fold the clothes, Wendy's combining, I bring her lunches and, and dinner just once though, because I do have an off-farm job at night, but I make sure she has enough food to get her through the night because we don't want hangry Wendy and Wendy doesn't want hangry Johnny. <laughs> yeah. We both we both need our, our food to, to keep us somewhat sane. I feel like so, hangry um, is probably the biggest predictor of farm divorce. <laughs> like... <laughs> All the biggest fights we've had have been hangry based. Oh, yeah. I just, I want to applaud you guys for just going to playing to your strengths instead of being too wrapped up in gender roles. Because, you know, just let people do what they're good at. So how have you guys handled the work-life balance that farming and working and parenting? I would say in general, the work-life balance of, of farming is really, really it's really hard and it, yeah. and it can be really disastrous I think overall the work-life balance it's still we're still we're still balancing and but now that we have more of our roles carved out and kind of our our vision 
for the future. And though Johnny says that I, I get off of one board and I add myself to another, or I get myself involved in 25 different things. It's not what I say. It's just what happens. It's what you do. Yeah, that's true. I feel I, judged by association here, Wendy. <laughs> well, Wendy always says, I'm so busy. I just don't have enough time for this. And I'm like, well, take yourself off off of a couple of things no but I like doing them well then you're going to continue to not have a lot of time it's my spice of life I guess I just have a lot of hobbies and I mean those are my hobbies is being involved in agriculture and I I guess that it keeps me it keeps me really busy but it also bugs my husband and my daughter because I'm not home or I'm not as focused at home that I, that I should be so I I have a continuing I I I have to continue to work at balancing things and, and making sure I have limits because I I just I just love being involved and I'm super I'm a super curious person and so like this I love chatting with with both of you and learning about you guys and your stories too like I wish this were more of like a three-way conversation because you guys have a lot. I'd love to learn more about both of you. So it's we could just have you on just, to interview us sometime. That'd be fun. Yeah. I, I mean, we already kind of know each other, you know, so we yeah. and each other, but it wasn't. A yeah. Reverse. And you can join the barnyard language group and then chat over there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 What is the vision that you have for your business going forward? Kind of short term and long term. What do you, what do you foresee happening on the farm and with the business going forward? So that's really all, always evolved. And what we're learning is we are moving with more of our strengths. So like one thing we've done is we, we were really into chickens for a while and we realized that that's probably our weakest point enterprise. And so both financially and just like our own patients. And so we have kind of, we've basically removed that as a major enterprise in, in our farming. What were you going to say? Egg layers. Yeah, we were up to like 600 broilers a year, I think at one time, but we had 300 egg layers at one point too. Yeah, and washing <laughs> eggs and all that. So we removed, removed some things to, to kind of expand on other things. And so we've grown our sheep flock and we're continuing to grow that flock and our buyer of our sheep, we do some direct to direct market selling of lamb but it's not the majority of it and we see lamb and sheep as a major regenerator of land and so and in integrating them into the into the crop rotations and integrating them onto the land is probably one of the best things that that, that we could do for our soil health and 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 for climate change and so we are are expanding our flock and our the buyer of our sheep has challenged us to think about what would it take us to have a thousand, a flock of a thousand ewes? Like what, what would that look like and what would it take? And to come back to them and say, okay, this is, this is how much it would take. And I love that open dialogue and I wish more businesses trusted farmers and trusted, trusted the people growing their food that they know they know what's best. And I, I just love that. And so, you know, you think about an animal per acre, that's like on, for cows, maybe three, four, three for sheep. Imagine what the kind of landscape change that would make in Iowa, which is mostly corn and soybeans to graze grass fed lamb of a thousand ewes. And so I don't know if that's 10 years away, or if that's five years away or or what that is, but it definitely has to compete with corn prices and also land value. So if, if they're willing to, to help us transition to that point, heck yeah, you know, that's, that's what I want to see. More perennials on the landscape, more trees and grasses and perennials and perennial grains, you know, like Kernza. We're kind of, we're not early adopters, but we are that next, that next level, you know, up from that. We're kind of like the next people after the earliest adopters of trying new things on the farm and seeing if they have value and if it works, if we enjoy doing it. So 
our long-term vision is to perennialize all the acres that we're, we're farming and kind of get out of the corn and soybean rut. Not to say that there's not room for corn and soybeans in any system here in Iowa. I mean, Iowa has some of the best soils in the world to grow high nutrient needing crops like corn, but there has to be some balance. And right now there is no balance. And you know, our strengths are in grazing, they're in planting trees, they're in kind of these offside, I don't know if you want to call them niche products. I, I wouldn't say that my strengths, I'm not the best corn farmer. I'm not the best soybean farmer. I know how to do it. I I do it because it's been in, you know, our family's done that for, you know, years and years, but do I love it? No. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta continue as we see our farms develop, you gotta do what you love, right? And we're seeing more and more wonderful, awesome farms doing things and people getting onto the land, even if it's two acres or, you know, a quarter acre and growing food, doing the things that they really love and getting their hands in dirt and soil and, and growing food for their, themselves and sometimes for their neighbors and community. That's what we need more of. And so I want to, I really want to help get more people on the land and get people to provide opportunity for people to get their hands dirty and even understand what agriculture is. With Johnny's wonderful person, personable um, characteristics. He's the extrovert out of both of us. I'm more, I'm more introverted. And so I can be extroverted when I want to, but it takes a lot of energy and he's just a natural extrovert and able to talk to anybody. And so having that personality and getting people on the farm and making it fun and getting more kids on the farm to see what agriculture is about, like a regenerative agriculture. Wendy, I think your future plan speaks so much to the importance of both fostering creativity in farmers of what might be possible and the importance of giving farmers the education and the resources to know what's reasonable and possible. You know, as far as like, how many animals can I actually put on this land? What's the price actually like? You know, that sort of thing. Because it's really easy to say no to things if you don't have the resources to say yes to them or it's really easy to say yes to things you shouldn't if you don't have the background to know how much you're screwing yourself over yeah absolutely and the every time we do any, anything different on the farm such as oats which isn't really that different but you know it's not corn soybeans mm-hmm. you have to compare it to what the opportunity cost of corn and and i just wondered to myself when is that when is that going to stop? Like, when can I stop comparing this enterprise budget to an enterprise budget of corn? And I'd really like to see that in, in, our, in our future, that king corn is not going to be always king corn. Like, if it weren't so highly subsidized, would we really be, or if we had, and we didn't have the ethanol industry, would we really be in the place we are? Yeah, it's, it's a time, I think, with climate change too, it's a time for farmers to get creative. It's going to be those that don't adapt to that that are going to have the most problems. Well, it's certainly more fun to be more diversified, I think. Except it comes back to that work-life balance again. (laughs) And so many people and so many hands. Yeah, I think it it is really important, too, to give yourself permission to quit enterprises that just you're just not suited to. If it's not working for you, don't do it. Unless it's something that your farm really depends on for income, I guess. Maybe then you shouldn't just stop. Well, like the farm, the farm, the land that we steward, you know, we could have, we could have 10 families work on this mm-hmm. farm, work and live on this farm. And they could supply food for robust local, regional, local and regional food economies. Like that is the, that's the end goal, right? And if we're not headed toward that, if we're not moving toward in that direction, then, you know, what are we doing? We're just playing the same, we're just kind of playing the same game as everybody else. And those things are really important to us and getting better food into the school systems and, and into institutions like nursing homes and hospitals. And, and we've just become so far from, from our food, even in rural Iowa, you know, where most of our food is imported. And I don't mean to get too like political or or, you know, get into the weeds about where our food comes from. But you guys are foodies too, and you, you grow food and you grow 
families and, and you have families that go to school and they eat school, school lunches. And so. I think it's interesting too, how the pandemic has highlighted those local food systems in a way that all the local talk before didn't really bring out. I mean, like it, it took just a few, few days or a few weeks of some food shortages to people for people to really realize, okay, if the food's not coming from my town or my province or my state or even from my country, then these blips, these transportation issues, these, you know, the, the pandemic, you know, whatever, all the different blocks that, that kind of work together to make food just magically appear in our grocery stores, it doesn't take that much for those systems to fall apart. And I think it really did show people that, that it is important to have domestic food production and local food production, and that it's not just trendy, that it's important both to our economies and, you know, to our society as a whole, that we produce the food that we eat. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head there, Arlene. Resiliency <laughs> is what we need more than anything. We are not resilient right now. And COVID showed us that. Arlene, I really want to get Wendy and Natasha on at the same time. That would be a, a fiery, fiery episode. Yes, That'd it be would. Good. Wendy, I don't know if you heard our interview with Natasha Nichols from the We So We Grow project in Chicago. No, I haven't. Episode three? Yeah. She has some so. thoughts. I'll tell you what, she okay. was a lot of fun to talk to. Awesome. They're an urban farm in the West Pullman neighborhood in Chicago. Oh, awesome. Was... I'll take a listen to that. Well, yeah, like how do, we, how do we invite people that are from urban areas to move their families and lives to rural Iowa, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's a question that I am working around, working on is how to make this place an inviting place for people who want, maybe want to get out of the city and want to grow some food, grow their own food, be a part of maybe a collaborative farm or, you know, some sort of collaboration where we're working with other families that have their own autonomy and their own, own like farm label and own farm, but it's on the farm that we all the land that we all steward together mm -hmm. and we help each other you know there's all these different you know ideas of of things that we can get more people to start farming on on this land i was just talking with someone this morning and they asked me well if it wasn't corn and soybeans what what would you grow what would you what would you have here if you had all this expansion of land like a thousand acres right if you didn't have corn and soybeans what would it be and i i couldn't believe you know people they, that they can't think outside the box like that. Yeah. Like, yes, that's what we see out our mm -hmm. windows every single day. But there's so much more that can be grown here. Yeah. So much more. And, and even if it's lettuce and like, if it's not a high tunnel or a greenhouse that can be heated, which is really expensive, obviously, during the winter. But I'm seeing like these like un underground, like built in like six to eight foot deep, basically like underground greenhouses. Yeah. You know, and so the temperature is stable down there. And so you can grow things, grow food in there. You have like these glass windows that are basically the same level as the ground and grow vegetables in it. And it, it's like genius. And it, <laughs> it's probably something that was done in like Little House in the Prairie days, but it's great. I mean, it's something that we could be doing to grow more food. And it's just, I think the, the, the options are, they're everywhere. They're out yeah. there. I find it so interesting too, you know, looking around our small towns that I meet people who have told me to my face, well, small towns are dead. There's no point, you know, people from our area and then people from small towns who just throw their hands up and go, well, we don't know what to do. And like, well, have yeah. you thought about making this somewhere that other people want to come to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because like our kids are in Postville now, which is a very different uh, demographic than most of the towns around here because it's very heavily an immigrant population and that town is booming pretty well for such a small place just because they actually have people moving in so it's I mean, the the opportunity is there mm -hmm. yeah it takes a village right to be yeah. able to create something that you want to see and i think a lot of agriculturalists want to see that's what see, wendy Wendy said that when we moved here, like when we get back to the thing that she's involved with so many different things, she said she wanted to make Trail City a place where she would want to live, you know? Yeah. I mean, not, not that that's a selfish thing. It's, it's really thinking big. And, you know, she started 
community garden where people could raise their own vegetables in town. She got a rain garden put in over the last two years. She had a tree arboretum where the the, people- the Go community ahead. fruit tree situation there on the corner in Charles City is that yours? Yeah, yeah. Because we drove past it the other day, and I was like, "Who the hell put a community fruit tree garden in Charles City?" This explains. <laughs> it. I, I think it's right. a great idea. I was just really surprised because it's not something I expected to see, and it was a it was a good surprise. Absolutely. Oh, good. Now I feel like I just ruined your. I was just really excited about your fruit trees. <laughs> Oh, it was great. I mean, that's what, what the point is, is people bought all these trees and we, we all went there and planted them and people are free to walk in there and pick some, some berries or whatever's growing and, and help themselves to it, you know, just leave some for other people. And then she also started a Charles City Chamber Orchestra where they performed for about six years in town and eight. it was eight years. Yeah. And then when the pandemic hit, they put a pause on it and we don't know if that's going to come back or not but it was really neat they did two shows a year and people come out and see a free concert you know they did a spring and a holiday one and she's just a real go-getter this one here hence why i need to marry a nurturer because <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't be eating at all <laughs> so you guys i i changed up our silly question what would your operations theme song be yeah we were trying to think. We were trying to think about a theme song because we saw that in your in your script there. And jo- Johnny's first suggestion was, <laughs> "It's an old Snoop Dogg Snoop song." Dogg. <laughs> we sing a lot of Snoop Dogg around the farm <laughs> simply because we love '90s hip hop, and we're from Long Beach, and so Snoop Dogg is it's from Long Beach. Call it ain't no fun if the homies can't have none. <laughs> Take that title any way you want, but there is a meaning to it. But it's very misogynistic. <laughs> But earlier today I was singing, I, I don't want to work. I just want to bang on my drum all day because I think a lot of farmers think like that sometimes because well, we, we work every day of the year. Yeah. That's so <laughs> that's a good song. I don't know that Jim appreciated my rendition of Corb Lund's Cows Around this morning while we were chasing cattle. <laughs> um, since the whole song is about how you'll never have too much money and you'll always have something to do because you'll be dealing with cattle. Now it is time for cussing and discussing, everybody's favorite segment. Arlene, what would you like to cuss and discuss today? So I was having a hard time coming up with something for today, but then our discussion around uh, multi-generational homes reminded me of a story. So we lived in another property when we were first married and, and here on the farm, but then about 10 years ago now my husband's grandmother moved to town into a retirement home and so we took over the family farmhouse so it's a 18 late 1800s old stone house and had been lived in continuously for you know multiple generations so this was the first time the house was actually going to be empty we had another place to live so we did a full renovation at that time and we didn't have to live in it which was amazing so took up lots of you know shag carpet those types of things uncovered some beautiful hardwood floors and decided to add modern conveniences like ductwork and you know electrical and plumbing that were functional for modern society and insulation because there was none in the house. So that meant taking down all the plaster, adding insulation, and then um, putting up drywall. I don't think my my grandmother-in-law really had a, had a good idea of what we were really getting into, because at one point she said, just for context, every single room in the house was wallpapered, and it was lots of florals, most rooms with an upper and a lower and a border in between. So there was lots of wallpaper going on. So she told me at one point, you know, I say, all the roll ends so if you're doing any patching in the house the roll ends are in such and such a location and you can use those to you know like do a little bit of patching and at that point there were almost no walls left in the entire home so I, I very graciously thanked her for the offer and uh, there's no wallpaper in our house anymore but it was very nice of her and I have used some of the roll ends for craft projects for some family members so they don't feel quite as distraught about the fact that we gutted the house but we gutted it and then brought it back to look almost exactly the way it did before, minus the floral wallpaper. Wendy, do you guys want to cuss and discuss? I got one just from today, but it, it's kind of, well, okay, so I got done with chores and it's about 11.20 and I already had some chicken out and I'm making an 
I was making chicken pad thai. So everything's going smoothly and it was just, it was a good morning. <laughs> so I just heated up the oil in my pan, getting ready to put the noodles in. But before I did that, I added the garlic. So I put my garlic in there and it was out of a, out of a garlic jar. And right when I go to put the jar down on the counter, it fell off the counter, hit the top of the dishwasher and garlic went everywhere. And I just let out a big fuck. <laughs> and so Vivian was upstairs, but she probably heard me anyways. But so I get that cleaned up and then I go to pour soy sauce to refill my soy sauce jar. I spilled some of that. And all of a sudden I just started having all these little mistakes going on. I started making a big mess and I'm like, so is this the rest of my day here? But it, it, it shipped up really, really quickly, but I had like five or five or six little fuck ups real quick. And yeah, I mean, it's just one thing after another, they start to snowball until you pull yourself out of that, that little, that hole you're, or that hill you're going down. And I think it, he was nervous for this podcast. So he was constantly thinking about it. <laughs> just manifesting a tremendous mess. Yeah. <laughs> Very messy cook, but the food's always tasting good. So that's the important part. Yeah. Katie, what are you going to cuss and discuss today? I don't even know. So here's something, and I'm going to say this is not about not wearing clothes. And I'm sorry, Wendy, if this offends your, your fashion soul. I'm <laughs> so sick of clothing. I'm so sick of picking out clothing. I'm sick of buying clothing. I'm sick of washing clothing, folding clothing, jumpsuits. Everybody gets like three jumpsuits and we're done. Amen. Not even socks. We're done with socks. I don't care. I don't want to pick them out. I don't want to think about them. Nothing. Uh, I'm just, I'm done. I'm I feel done. you. They tell you death and taxes are the only guarantees in life. They never forget to tell you about dirty dishes and folding laundry forever. Yeah, the never ending laundry is, is uh, <laughs> it never stops. And one other thing while we're talking about modern conveniences, we had somebody over last weekend who brought a, a preteen with them. And I mean, she was a sweet, sweet kid, but she was so shocked that we only had one bathroom. Mm. And as a like, honey, they only put in a bathroom in 1964. Like, <laughs> that's the original tub and sink. They're, yeah, they're bright pink. You know, at least we got rid of the poodle wallpaper. But I just like, that she was just so shocked by this. Anyway. All right. Well, I really appreciate you guys joining us. This was thanks super for fun. Having us. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. Arlene, do you have anything else? I don't think so. Just thanks to Wendy and Johnny for joining us yeah. today. And we would welcome you to uh, join us on our next episode. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Nice.